Today we will continue our series on Surah Al-Shu'ara. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he gives us a sneak peek at what will happen in the afterlife, particularly to the inhabitants of hell. After that, Allah briefly tells the story of several prophets, Nuh, Hud, Salih, Lut, and Shu'aib alayhi salam. Allah Azza wa Jal says, wa uzlifatil jannatu lil muttaqeen, wa burzitu wa burrizatil jahimu lil wawin, wa qila lahum, ayna ma kuntum ta'budun min dunillahi, hal yansurunakum aw yantasirun. On that day, paradise will be brought near to those who feared Allah, and the hellfire will be displayed for those who went astray, and it will be said to them, where are those idols that you used to worship besides Allah? Can they help you now, or can they even help themselves? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives special emphasis here to those punished in hell. And it might occur to us to ask, well, why is that? Is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an angry, wrathful God? Is it because the best way to motivate someone is always through fear and threats? We know that this can't be true. Allah Azza wa Himself said in a hadith Qudsi, in the Rahmati Sabahat Abalabi, My mercy outpaces my wrath. Even looking at the Quran, usually Allah Azza wa Jal gives equal space and time to discuss the people of paradise and the people of hellfire. But in this particular chapter, Surah so Al-Shu'ara, it's different. Allah Azza wa Jal focuses on those who would be punished in hell. To answer why, the answer becomes clear when we keep in mind who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to reach with this particular chapter, Surah Al-Shu'ara as well as the other chapters that were revealed around a similar time. These chapters were revealed not at the beginning of the Prophet's mission, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but later on in the Mecca period. At this point, the Quraysh have seen miracle upon miracle. Surah Al-Najm has already been revealed where everyone automatically prostrated at the Kaaba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moon has already been split. Pretty much everyone knows the truth at this point. They are simply in denial. Worse than that, they aren't happy to just disagree or to debate, but they attempt to brutally suppress the message of Tawheed through threats of violence and physical intimidation. The most suitable message for such people is to get tough with them, to tell them point blank that they are playing with fire here, they are headed for trouble. Allah Azza wa Jalla has been very patient and understanding up until this point, but if they keep it up, they will not only be punished in eternity, but Allah Azza wa Jalla will destroy them in a dramatic fashion in this life, just like the nations before them who rejected their messengers. The orientation of the Quraysh at this point towards Allah's signs is one of arrogance, not ignorance. So emphasizing the punishment that awaits them, the hellfire is just what the doctor ordered. This teaches us something about how to deal with other people and how to motivate them. There's not just one way. There's a time and a place for encouragement, for leniency, for gentleness. And there's a time to be stern with people and to warn them. Wisdom is knowing which situation calls for which approach. People are different. 
Some people are sensitive and self-critical, and if you treat them sternly, they will crumble and break. Those people need to be encouraged. They need to be affirmed. Other people are so hard-headed that they need to be shaken awake. They can't take a hint. They need to be told directly. In any Muslim community, but especially in a community like ours, which is as diverse as it is, we need to be even more careful about this. Take time to learn what motivates someone before you try to correct them. Or as we say, connect before you correct. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the Quraysh and us too a window into what will happen to the insincere souls who rejected the truth. As they are cast into hell upon their faces, they will say, Tallahi ilma kunna lafi ghalali mubeen Yusawikum bi rabbil alameen Wa ma adallana illa al-mujrimoon Fa ma lana min shafi'een Wa la sadiqin hameen Fa law anna lana karratan Fa nakuna min al-mu'mineen By Allah, we were clearly mistaken when we made you idols equal to the Lord of all the worlds, and none led us astray other than those who were wicked. Now we have none to intercede for us or any close friend. If only we could have a second chance, then we would surely be believers. The people who were gripped by arrogance, the people who chose denial as their way, they will be left with nothing but regret. Their confession upon being thrown into the hellfire is brutally honest. Now they see everything for how it really is. They see how different figures in their lives misled them and how their own ego was willing to be misled. They see how it provided them just a fleeting moment of enjoyment, only to leave them bankrupt in the next life. Their entire life has become a source of burning regret. <laughs> regret is a powerful feeling, and often a very honest feeling. When I was a student in Medina, I used to ask the older students and the graduating students that were about to leave, not what was their achievements, what were they most proud of, but what were their regrets? What would they have done differently? I felt then, and I, I think that I was right, that they would be more honest about their regrets than their achievements. To regret something in the first place is to confess to a truth that you might have done something better than you did it. It's the voice of your conscience. Even if it's overly harsh, some people are too critical of themselves and beat themselves up over very, very small things. But the fact that you have that little voice, that part of your conscience, is extremely valuable. It's better than the opposite problem, not having any regrets at all about anything. That would indicate arrogance. This is the meaning of the hadith of our Prophet, Hadith Wabisal, Ibn Ma'bad, Qala Ataytu Nabiyyin, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Faqala, Jinta Tassal An Al Bir. Naam, Qala, Qaltu, Qultu Naam, Faqala, the companion Wabisaw ibn Ma'bad came to the Prophet and the Prophet knew already why he was coming. He said to him, You came to ask about righteousness? Yes, the companion Wabisaw said. The Prophet ﷺ said, ask your own heart. Righteousness is what puts one's soul at ease. 
And sin is what troubles the soul and causes the heart to doubt, even if other people tell you that it's fine. <coughs> Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا آيَةٌ وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ Surely if this is a sign, yet most of them would not believe. And your Lord is certainly the Almighty, most merciful. It's all a sign to think about for those who are open to the possibility of belief and faith, the regrets of those who have gone before us, the eternal consequences in the afterlife, the voice of our conscience, everything is there for us to think about and to use the intelligence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to take heed, to turn back, to repent, to fix ourselves. Those who have been buried have the will to change, but not the opportunity. Us in this life have the opportunity, if only we could find the will. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله على الإحسان والشكر له على توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأحمد لا شريك له تعظيما في شأنه وأشهد أن نبينا وسيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله والداعي إلى عنوانه صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وإخوانه وسلموا تسليما كثيرا. The very next section of this chapter continues the tone of warning, warning the Quraysh specifically of an impending disaster. Allah Azza wa Jalla begins to tell the stories of the prophets in an abbreviated form, one after the other. The purpose is to warn the Quraysh of their impending doom, should they continue to reject their own messenger. It's as if to say, if the afterlife, if heaven and hell are, are too far away and too abstract for you to care about, then at least consider what might happen to you here and now. Allah Azza wa Jalla begins with the story of Nuh, then Hud who was sent to Ad, then Salih who was sent to Tamud, then Lut who was sent to Sodom, then Shu'ayb who was sent to Madian, alayhim as -salam. The details of the stories are slightly different, but the main idea is the same. Allah actually repeats the words of the prophets over and over, word for word, all of them saying the same thing. Inni lakum rasulun ameen, fattakullaha wa atti'oon, wa ma as'alukum alayhi min ajri, in ajriya illa ala rabbil alameen, fattakullaha wa atti'oon. I am truly a trustworthy messenger to you, so fear Allah and obey me. I do not ask you for any reward for this message. My reward is from the Lord of all worlds, so fear Allah and obey me. We learn from these stories the common thread connecting all of the prophets, their message that they are all calling to the same thing, so fear Allah and obey me. Fear, here translated from taqwa, which also means awareness and caution. This represents the internal dimension of faith. What you do when no one's watching? What's your motivation to obey? The thing that you feel inside, the love you have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hope that you have in Allah's promises, the fear that you have of Allah's ability to punish. Obedience, on the other hand, represents the external dimension of faith on the outside. What are our actions? What are our choices, our priorities? How are we living our lives? Fear Allah and obey. 
These are the two essential ingredients of faith, inside and outside. There is not any true obedience without fearing Allah on the inside. And there is no true fearing Allah on the inside without any obedience on the outside. This is the call of the prophets, internal and external faith. How are the prophets going to get their people to believe? Where is the proof? إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ إِنْ أَجْرِي إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I am a trustworthy messenger to you. I do not ask you for any reward for this message. My reward is only from the Lord of all the worlds. Being trustworthy comes first. Sometimes these days, people take an interest in Dawa, inviting other people to Islam. That's wonderful. But sometimes when we think of Dawa, we think of debate, we think of some sort of intellectual combat. The Bible is changed, the Trinity is blasphemy. How could you believe that the universe did not have a creator? Again, all of this is wonderful. Allah uses these arguments in the Quran. But sometimes, our da'wah is missing a key ingredient because being right does not mean that we will be believed. Are we trustworthy? A beautiful message delivered by someone who is not trustworthy is like a sports car without a steering wheel. It's not going to take you anywhere and no one's even going to buy it no matter how nice it looks from the outside. Our Prophet وسلم, understood the importance of being trustworthy and how essential it was to the spread of Islam. This is why he was asked, عن عبد الله بن جرام أن مسأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا نبي الله هل يزني المؤمن؟ قال قد يكون من ذلك Abdullah ibn Jarrah asks the Prophet وسلم, can a believer fornicate? Can he have illicit relationships? The Prophet وسلم, said, it's possible. Yes, that is possible. Then he asked the Prophet وسلم, can a believer steal? Prophet ﷺ replied, it's possible that that could happen. Then he asked the Prophet, can a believer lie? He replied, no. Then the Prophet وسلم, recited verse 105 from Surah Al Nahl Only those who don't believe invent lies. The Prophet وسلم, was walking one day in the marketplace of Medina, one day after it had rained. He passed by a grain seller who was selling grain out of a basket like they used to do. Strangely enough, the grain looked dry, even though it had just rained. The Prophet وسلم, stuck his hand down into the basket, and he found that the grain underneath was wet. The seller had just put dry grain on top of the wet stuff to cover it up. The Prophet وسلم, confronted the man and he confessed that he didn't want people to know that his grain was wet and not buy it. So the Prophet وسلم, corrected him and said, Man minni, Whoever cheats has nothing to do with me. And in the ruwayah, Whoever cheats us, he has nothing to do with us. If someone is going to cheat, it's better that he doesn't even associate himself with us. Because we're trying to bring a movement. 
We're trying to bring guidance. We're trying to bring light to the world. And if you cheat someone and you are associated with this movement, you will damage the reputation of Allah's guidance and everyone else that follows it. It's better that nobody thinks that you're a Muslim. We want nothing to do with you. If we follow the guidance of the Prophet amazing things will happen. Malaysia, Indonesia, these are all Muslim lands without a single battle being fought, without a single sword being lifted. Why? Because the Muslims who went there for business, they feared Allah. They were honest. They looked out for the rights and interests of their customers more than they looked out for their own rights and interests. And that is the best thing that you can do for God, to be trustworthy. The messengers were trustworthy. And to prove their trustworthiness to their people, they made it clear that they had no conflict of interest or ulterior motive at all. I do not ask you for any reward for this message. My reward is only from Allah. Rewards come in many, many forms. Money, status, praise, reputation. People of faith turn to Allah for their reward, not other people. We don't serve the masjid to give an example, to put our name on it, to get an award at the end of the year. We don't give charity to others to be thanked, or so we can cash in on a favor down the road. Sincerity is not wanting any reward from this dunya, but only in the afterlife. And being sincere, desiring a, war, a reward, from the afterlife prevents you from being taken advantage of by the devil, who threatens you with the loss of what you have and promises you that reward that you really want. The messengers were sincere. What was the reaction of these to these perfect signs that they brought, that the messengers carried and explained sincerely? Nothing but excuses. The people of Nuh said, look at your poor followers. We won't follow you if it means associating with these guys. The people of Salih and Shuraib said, you're affected by magic. You're just a man like we are. Show us a sign. Of course, once they got their sign, they just found another excuse. The people of Hud and the people of Hud resorted to threats of violence. We will expel you, we will kick you out if you keep it up. Leave us to our ways. Arrogance, not ignorance. They knew better. They were given a chance and they were not sincere enough to take advantage of that chance. Is there any other appropriate response for such people other than punishment. Some people are confused. Some people think that the only way to be merciful is to forgive. Allah Azawajal is more merciful than you. Allah is more merciful than me. He's more merciful than any of us and yet He punishes. Because even His punishment is a mercy. Isn't it a mercy to rid the earth of such arrogance? Think of all the oppressed creatures that breathed a, a sigh of relief when these people were destroyed. Allah says, neither the heavens nor the earth wept for them. Like Allah says in Surah Al-Dukhan. Isn't it a mercy to make them into a sign, an example for people later on? if they had not been punished in spectacular fashion 
the Quraysh and every other oppressive people could point to them and say, look, nothing happened to them. We don't expect anything to happen to us either. Allah Azza wa Jal is Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, most merciful. And also he's Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. He's the most just. He forgives everything to those who are sincere. As for those who are not sincere, Allah Azza wa Jal has prepared for them a fair and just punishment. ثم صلى الله عليه وسلم قال النبي رحمه كما أعطاكم رب الرحيم قال إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد الله مبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بارت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين وتدمر أعداء الدين وانصر عبادك المؤمنين وجعل اللهم بلاد الإسلام آمن مطمئن يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر إخواننا المستضعفين في كل مكان اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات يا سميع الدعوات اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا باطل باطله وارزقنا اجتنابه يا عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القربة وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذبون لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم والله يعلم ما تصنعون Thank you.